Welcome to Explore, Explain, Highlights. In this highlights package, we'll be looking at Season 4, Episode 2, with our guests, Jared Whalen and Will Chase, discussing the project, the history of pickup trucks. I mean, the first thing that we see in this piece is this big sort of hero image of this, what feels to me like a pickup truck county, this sort of rugged landscape and a kind of highway shooting through it and a a sort of lovely uh, kind of Axios style sort of diner sign uh, in in spirit. Again, from the point of view of your team and your thinking about how this might play out as a project, when did you identify the possibility and the need potentially for illustration skills and sort of photo imagery skills to enrich this uh, enrich this piece certainly um one of my favorite parts of working in axios is our fantastic illustration team if people don't necessarily know axios they probably have seen an axios illustration our wonderful team of designers just has, have such a distinct style gets each of them bring their own amazing talent to it that makes it uniquely their own for this project um, I'm sure we'll get to this later, talking about how long it took for us to get this one out the door. But we had a Google Doc that for months and months and months at the very top of this Google Doc, it just had this gray box that said <laughs> illustration here. And then like some <laughs> 30 words summarizing what this might be. And um, I, as the, the primary developer on this project, as I'm building this project, I had my placeholder at the very top of the story. And for months and months, I was like, oh, I can't wait to see what we what we do when we finally get to the point of asking for an, for an, uh, an illustrator. And that conversation came fairly late because we wanted to make sure that we had the design scheme locked down, the color palette, and just try to give our illustrator, um, Sarah in this case, mm-hmm. all the resources she need. And when we did tell her, in what felt like a matter of days, she comes back with this incredible illustration that is somehow captured the entire look and feel of the project in a single image. Um, and like you said, it's the very first thing you see. And this project, among others, that illo becomes the thing people associate with the project because yeah. whether that's what you're seeing on Twitter or whether it's just that the image or the illo has such movement to it. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think that we definitely see that in this project. Absolutely. Sure. Um, when we build these, um, kind of like I alluded to earlier, our typical Axios reader, they're very used to that bite-sized content. Mm. So this is something we talk about over every one of these projects. One, how do we get that reader into this project in the first place? And once they're there, how do we make it feel like an Axios story that it, it maintains the rules of, of, of smart brevity that is digestible, but still is doing something different. Still the, what we would consider quote long form mm. for this. When we approach this, we say, okay, how much can we put in this where it's still maintains those principles? And I think right. this story is a really good example of how we did that because at the end of the day, we are targeting that Axios reader. Sure. If we can pick up new people who discover us on Twitter or this type of story gets shared in a space that normally Axios content wouldn't go and we get to new readers, that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, what we really want is that current Axios audience to look to towards Axios and our team for this type of stuff. So we have to make sure that, okay, this is going to have a lot more copy than a typical story, but let's make sure that it's still maintaining those principles. Sure, this might have a dozen charts instead mm-hmm. of one chart, but let's make sure that everything we put into this is still something that can be shared independently, something that if somebody pulls out of the story and puts on Twitter or Reddit, it is still informative and still lets the reader leave feeling smarter. But to what extent does the desktop versus mobile create attention in your in your thinking? I'm guessing that these days you're primarily mobile first in your thinking but for something like this which does require space it does require distance um yeah. what's what's the sort of tension that sit, sits there will so i mean i can give a quick answer from the design perspective and then jared might have some things to say because 
as the developer, this is mm -hmm. often, sometimes a lot of this is, is put onto uh, the development side. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're right that, so if you talk to like a product designer at Axios uh, or like someone on our audience team and they look at the statistics, they'll tell you like, basically they'll say phones are the only thing that matter. You know, 90% of our audience is on their phone. Um, but for what I've found, just looking at the numbers for these sorts of pieces is that is oftentimes not true for big uh, visual stories. So, right. you know, whether people are seeing it on their phone and thinking, oh, I want to go look at this on my computer or for whatever reason, they're coming to it. So on bookmarking a things, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the analytics are really often more like 60, 40 or 50, 50. Um, so we can't, you know, we have to really consider both experiences and, uh, and, you know, try not to lose anything from either side. Um, and then there's always, you know, we can get into details, I'm sure at some point, there's always little, you know, tips and tricks you can use for, for optimizing things for phones. But um, I think the main goal is just to preserve the same experience, sure. um, you know, even if it's not in the exact same format. Yeah, yeah. Is that a fair comment, Jared, from your point of view? Certainly. I think that the mobile first mindset is something that a lot of us web developers strive to, but at the same time, at least I feel on the database side, you as soon as you get the opportunity to do one of these types of larger projects, your brain goes big and you're thinking of these full screen <laughs> displays and you get excited and then you have yeah. to dial it back and remember, okay, how can we get this to work? And yeah. Fortunately, like in a project like this, the majority of the content works very well on both desktop and mobile. The The charts are responsive. The body copy simply um, um, fills the page. Um, but those who have taken a look at the story, and I know we'll get into this further, one of the primary elements is this scrolly telly section where we take the reader through the evolution of the pickup truck. And this is a case where the mobile experience and the desktop experience are actually entirely separate. The one involves the, the mobile experience involves slides and is much more typical of a of a scroll telly where you kind of the the text goes over top of the background yes. content and you kind of scroll through whereas the desktop is more of a kind of like a slideshow where yeah. the text is changing with the background imagery and this was a case where we prototyped multiple versions originally we tried to have the mobile version reflect more like the desktop and we just had to through user testing, through um, just um, prototyping, coming up with some design choices to say what is the best way to serve both of these audiences, um, but still have the same experience or at least the sure. same quality of experience. What were the pressures that you were facing in terms of timescales? Was there a, a deadline instantly a said, established to say, right, we, we've got to get this done by then? Or was it a bit more of a background project running alongside the more sort of uh, instantaneous news stuff. What was the, what's the time story, shall we say? I think distant background project is a very good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was going to say that there, um, who was it's like uh, the quote, it's like, I love deadlines. I love the sound they make as they go whooshing past. Um, <laughs> so I think that was this project. Like, did we have an initial deadline? Yes. Um, was the project, not published until like a year after that initial deadline <laughs> also yes um so yeah um but it, it was background like to jared's point it, you know this was a time like this story was really started before this whole team like specialized team for doing this sure. existed um and so it was very much a background project for a long time uh and we sort of worked on it whenever we could then we'd get busy with something else and have to pivot to that and then come back to this um and so you know it was that was one of the reasons it took a long time uh another reason it took a long time was just that it is a big story in terms of mm. scope um yeah. and there was you know a lot of information a lot of research we needed to do many tangents that we explored that never you know didn't make it into the story but took up time um and then there was a lot of new stuff, at least from my end, for sure. Um, you know, and I think also from the development side, there were definitely some new things that we were trying out with this, you know, all the 3D modeling and the animations and that stuff that was, you know, involved us like learning new tools or yeah. experimenting and building things that we'd never built before. Um, and so that always takes time. 
But I think with that, there's. I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Jared. But just on that note, I think there's something that comes across again from the Axios team there that you are encouraged to um, to innovate. You are encouraged to experiment and try things out. And I guess with that, there's an acceptance that something won't land. But I guess you trying this out and the different techniques that we'll talk about shortly you might reuse them, you know, the, the animation method you might reuse. So that investment in time now may pay off uh, in, in, in due course. And just to let you pick up on that, um, Jared, in terms of your experience of the time scales. Sure. Um, this project, I think, and projects like it are something that Axios and our visuals team were trying to still trying to figure out that rhythm. Because like Will mentioned earlier, this storytelling specific team is fairly new. Mm. And up until that, these types of projects were considered nice to haves that fit into everybody else's schedule. And at the time, everybody's the primary responsibility for everybody in the team were those bite-sized daily graphics that went out in newsletters. So Axios and the visuals team investing in these types of stories, to your point, is very beneficial for the future because you're 100% correct. We are already reusing components that we built for this project and projects that are going out in the near future. We are already seeing that investment pay off, but we're still probably trying to find that sweet spot of how long should a project like this take? How do we balance the time between those day-to-day -day operations with these um, longer goal, longer term goals. Right. Um, I can speak to this a little bit because um, I was doing a lot of work with, with Joanne to collect this data. Um, every project I'd say has unique data challenges. You know, sometimes it's just a huge data set that you need to collect by hand or it's, mm. you know, this was not any of that. Like this was all very small data, I would say. Um, but it was really, really challenging for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, anytime you're working in like a commercial industry, um, there's reasons that people don't want you to have data, sure. right? So like in the case of pickup trucks, um, it's difficult to find this stuff because a lot of times it's behind industry reports and, you know, special marketing firms that want you to pay for this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a case where Joanne was crucial in getting a lot of the data because you know, as a reporter in the industry, she has connections uh, to, um, you know, not only know who those people are, but have unique access to get that data without, um, you know, paying thousands of dollars for it. Sure. Um, the other challenge was that um, we had a pretty big time span that we wanted to get the data for. So, you know, in terms of the the story of these trucks, it goes Basically, uh, we wanted to go back from like the 1960s through to modern day. Um, and a lot of data just wasn't collected for that big of a time span. So we had to figure out, you know, what sort of claims can we make um, if we can't get the data for the entire time period? Uh -huh. um, or, you know, for the same reason, that time period, uh, the data often comes from very disparate sources. And so... You know, it's not like you have one data provider um, that's giving you everything you need. So you have to reconcile those sources. Uh, sometimes even the same metric, uh, different time periods were coming from totally different data sets or different measurement techniques. So, you know, we just had to be pretty upfront, I think, with uh, the limitations that we were able to, or the limitations that we had on the data. Um, but, uh, you know, it it sort of, it worked out in the end, I would say. Yeah. To you, Jared, on this. Yeah, I think everything Will said is 100% correct. I think that this type of project, what we mean by data can often be surprising. I think the sure. most difficult data that we worked with, and that I'll probably actually send this back to Will, was the, the pickup truck renderings. Because I know that Will had a heck of a time tracking down the right um, assets to find, um, getting them to basically all work together. And I think that is just one of those things that you might not always think of when you kind of go from that data analysis space to that visualization space, that it's not all CSVs. Sometimes you're Correct. working with um, these um, 3D renderings, which are very much were part of the storytelling process because the most widely shared 
uh, visualization in this was using those assets to visually compare tabs and beds. And we would never have been able to do that if we weren't able to get these um, to the inch accuracy files. Yeah. Um, Thank you for joining us for this Explore, Explain, Highlights episode. As always, the full episode is available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. We hope to see you again soon on another episode of Explore, Explain.